Hello, everybody. Uh, David Sharon, pastor of Street Life Ministries. Uh, so excited. This is our very first episode coming back after taking a, a, a little hiatus uh, from our podcast and YouTube channel. And uh, this morning I interviewed uh, a new friend of mine, David, um, and got to hear his testimony. And he's sharing that with us today. Powerful, powerful stuff. I, I can't wait for you to hear it and watch it. What an amazing uh, man and uh, what a, uh, an amazing testimony and vulnerability to share his story with us. As I listen to his uh, testimony, and as you're going to hear it as well, I just want to reach out to anybody who watches this. If you're dealing with uh, thoughts of suicide or you're dealing with any kind of mental health or depression of any kind, please uh, don't hesitate to call uh, your local police department um, and ask for help. Um, if you if this is something that is an ongoing battle uh, with you, uh, you can call us uh, on our website. You can reach out to us. We we have many Christian pastors who would be willing to uh, work with you. We have therapists that we're connected with in the mental health uh, industry that would have absolutely no problem uh, connecting with you and helping you out to battle uh, those kind of uh, demons, those voices. Um, but as you listen to this story and you watch this video, uh, you see a man who is been through a lot. Uh, he is. He has been through a lot from a very early age all the way to his adulthood. It's powerful, but he gives all of the glory and all of the change and transformation in his life uh, to Jesus Christ, as we all do who come and, and share uh, with us at Street Life Ministries. I'm really grateful uh, that this is the very first one that we get to share. This is powerful, and I hope you enjoy it. And uh, like always, uh, we, we're always looking for your help and support. If you uh, don't mind going on to our website, uh, there'll be a donation link uh, in this in this YouTube video. Um, go on that donation link and help support us and help fund us uh, for all of our, our efforts and what we're trying to do to help those who live on the streets and for those who uh, are in going through a transformation in their life and as we help them uh, through that transformation in their life. So like always, we give all credit and glory to Jesus Christ. So thank you so much. And I hope you enjoy listening if you're on podcast and watching if you're on YouTube. Thank you and God bless. Hey everybody, uh, I am here. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, whatever you uh, decide to listen or watch our YouTube uh, channel. I am. We are back, Street Life Ministries. It's been a little over a year and I have the uh, pleasure of uh, sitting here with my friend David. We're going to hear an amazing testimony. So uh, let's just go ahead and get started. We'll start off with a little bit of prayer and then we'll go ahead and get started, okay? Amen. Heavenly Father, uh, we come to you right now, Father. We ask, uh, Lord, that uh, the work that you have done through my brother David and through his testimony, we pray that it uh, speaks volumes into whoever listens or watches uh, this uh, podcast and YouTube channel. Lord, I pray that hearts will, will bend and mend to you, God, and ask for your forgiveness. And I pray that uh, there's healing involved in this and uh, uh, an awareness. And I just pray that whoever... Uh, hears this and watches this, uh, feels your your spirit, your power, God. We know that all things are only possible through your son, Jesus Christ. And we call upon you right now. You say if two or more to gather in your name that you're present. So thank you, Lord, yes. for being with us today. Yes, and uh, bless my brother David as he shares his testimony thank this you, morning. Lord. So we ask uh, all these things in your son's name, in Jesus Christ. Jesus Amen. Name. Amen. All right. So how's it going, bro? Man, I'm a little jittery now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. The camera and the lights. Hey, praise God, though. I mean, yeah. I, a beautiful prayer. It's all good. It's all good. Yes, sir. So, okay. So give us a little bit. So born and raised? Born and raised in Daly City, California. Okay. Um, home. What was the home life? Mom, dad? Uh, mom, dad was there. They had me at a young age. Okay. So 14, Brothers, 15. sisters? Uh, sister. I have uh, one sister with my mom and my dad, and then I have... Uh, Three sisters with my mom, and they, they all have the same dad. We have a different dad. And then my dad has another child. I only met her once when he signed his rights over. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so your, your mom and dad, uh, they divorced then? No, they never married. Never married. Okay. My dad got kicked out the house when I was nine because he tried to kill my mom. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Sorry to hear that. Yeah. Um, are you Are you close to your dad today? No, I don't speak to him. You don't speak to him. No. No, he's not even in your life. Don't know where he is or nothing no. like that. I know where he is, but I don't. Okay. Don't socialize with him. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, your mom. My mom's there. She she has, she has a little she has a, a different path, but my mom always been like a, a sister to me. It's always okay. been like a brother sister type relationship. Okay. Yeah. 
Awesome, awesome. Yeah. Well, that's really cool. And she still lives here in Daly City? Or? She lives in Antioch. Antioch. With uh, my three other sisters. Okay. Now, how about you and your siblings? Are you guys close? We're, we have a, my three sisters that my mom stays with, we have a, a rough um, bond. But my sister that is my closest sister with the same parents, we, we are, we're tight. Yeah, that's, okay. I consider her like my daughter because they've always been me and her growing up. And, okay. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, tell us a little bit about your childhood, R- being raised in the mean streets of Daly City. <laughs> what, what was that like? Uh, a lot of people look at it as being just the suburbs and there's nothing nothing bad can happen in Daly City, but every household got their own share of works, you know, whether sure. you're from the slums of, of where you live or just the, the nice part of every every household. And my household was... Very chaotic, violent, angry, loud, abusive, sex, drugs, you can name it. It mm. was in my household. Um, our household growing up was, we was a family that always had all extra families inside the house. So you had everybody there. It's, mm. you, you're sleeping on the floor, you're sleeping in the hallway, you're sleeping in the bathtub, you bunk beds, whatever. It was always a lot of people and very chaotic. It's yeah. very traumatizing. What, what nationality are you? I'm a mix. I'm a mix. I'm everything. Are you Sicilian, <laughs> Filipino, Mexican, Spanish, German, and Irish? Wow, man, you got it all in there. All the tempers. You got some hot blood. And, <laughs> <laughs> wow, you got everything, huh? All the tempers, most definitely. Yeah, man. So there's not there's not a there's not a food that I could put down in front of you that you wouldn't like. Uh, no, I'm get, I'm getting down. I'm very curious. I'm, a lot of people always ask me like. What type? What's your favorite food? I'm bipolar, so I, my my emotions are different. <laughs> watermelon can be my favorite food, and then the next, I don't like watermelon. It could be hot dogs. It could be whatever. It just depends on how my mood is. It's and I love cooking as well. So yeah, most definitely. Awesome, awesome, yeah. awesome. So uh, how was how was your school life? Uh, school was, was it, it was a a mimic of what my household was. Okay. Um, growing up, I was very lonely. I had people there, but I was still lonely inside. Yeah. Um, my my immediate family, we all stayed with our major family, majority of family, right? So it was never me and my mom, my sister, my dad alone. It was only like a certain, a certain part of time where we was alone, but other than that, we stayed with my grandmas and people. So going to school was very lonely. I've always had like uh, empty ambitions. I always had empty desires. So I always clinged on to people. Mm-hmm. I've always needed self-validation from people. I've always needed acceptance from people because my home was very cold, very lonely. Um, it was more like a materialistic type love, conditional love. Like, here's some money, here's gifts, here's this, here's that. But it was no like, how are you doing? So when I went to school, it was violent. It was like, I was always angry. I was always blaming my dad for reasons why I was feeling the way I was feeling because he was a drug addict. He left us. He'd rather choose the streets and go spend his money on his next dope sack. And I was angry, so I, I try to build family outside of my home just so I can feel some type of acceptance or love or want. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so anytime I had a problem or situation, it was always fighting. I, that, was, that was what I was known for, was fighting. Sure. And I was angry, angry. So um, did, you, did you get into any kind of gang stuff or did you click into anything or, my, or just solo? Yeah, my clicks wasn't, I don't really consider it a gang. I mean, it wasn't a red and blue type situation. It was just more of a family. Um, I was born on, you know, Westmore Skyline. So Westline became my identity. It was, it was a group of kids that just loved each other. Okay. And we grew up together and that's what it was. It was, you know, Polynesians and mixed races and okay. Pacific Islanders. So we just came together and it was just no identity of like you guys are known by this color or it was just we were just known by west line okay so walk us through that so um, cuz i know that you have a kind of a colorful past so kind of walk us yeah. through walk us through that journey a little bit how did you you know where did that where did that lead you and and where where did you end up and and like where you i mean obviously you're saved and on yeah. fire for christ most now definitely, so most definitely. Yes, sir, yes, <laughs> which is which is yeah. which is a good which is a good outcome but i mean okay. but you had to go through some stuff to get there right, right most definitely i mean I, i'll start and then you could just you know intervene when you feel necessary sure um so growing up uh, i was born in scene hospital daily city uh we moved to pacifica uh for a little while and just there it was just drinking, partying, seeing families just fighting and going through the abuse of it. Uh, five years old, tried to commit suicide. 
I was a very suicidal person. Um, since I could start talking and remembering, I just wanted to kill myself for whatever mm. reason. Um, you know, growing up, I've, I've always heard like, you know, mom was, you know, dealing with, you know, like black magic, white magic, but it wasn't extreme. It was just like card readings, palm reading, certain certain potions and medicines and talking to the mediums and stuff like that. Um, so growing up, I looked at it as maybe that was passed down to me from what was happening inside my household. Um, but I never really understood why I've always wanted to kill myself. It was just, it was there. And then when I, when I started growing older, that was like my outlet, you know, certain pain and, and, Things that I've seen, uh, fighting and abuse and mom getting beat up and drug abuse and me being neglected, I was just like, this is my outlet. It felt good to cut myself. It felt good to drink my own blood. It felt good to see how much blood came out of my body. And then fighting people was just like even more extravagant. It's like I fought people because it's like I seen how much pain they had. It was like, okay, you have more pain than me. I feel better. So it's just like I've, I've always understood like... Um, hurt people hurt people. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, I wanted to hurt somebody so bad more than I have because it, it made me feel better that you had more pain than me. Okay, cool, I'm almost settled. But really, I still had more pain than anything else. Um, mom and dad was always arguing. Dad always went out. Me and my dad's relationship wasn't well. It was like, I had to fight to be in his presence. I had to prove myself to be in his presence. We have the family events and all the, the older adults and they'll make their, their kids fight each other. It was just like, who's the best kid? Who, who, who can play sports better? Who can fight better? Who can do this better? And I was always the winner. I was always beating people up one-on-ones, all my cousins, and then they would do like five against one. It was like, they would try to jump me because I was just too strong and I was too violent because I was already doing what I was doing in the streets, right? So it, that made my dad happy so much to where it's just like, now I became this monster. Like, if I could get that attention from you, that I might as well have become this, the, the craziest monster in the world because I'm not getting I'm not getting attention from you any elsewhere. So when my dad would try to leave, I was maybe in like first grade, second grade or so. I was living in Templeton in Daly City, and um, now it was me and my mom, and my sister, and we have our own place. And there, I was always suspicious on where my dad went, and I was always see my my uncles and my cousins and my dad on drugs, just zoned out of their mind. And now that I'm older, look back, they're all PCP. Um, and there was just being weird. So every time my dad would leave, I would always want to be with him. He never wanted me to go. Mm -hmm. So what I would do to try to be with my dad is I'll hide in the back of his seat under a blanket. And every time he leave, I'll pop up when I, I, we're on the freeway. And he used to always get mad at me. Now that I'm older, I knew where we was going. We was going to the projects and he'll buy me stuff just to keep me entertained, like McDonald's or snacks, just to just keep me distracted from what was really going on. He would go buy his drugs and we'll go somewhere. He'll let me run around while he just go smoke his, smoke his drugs. But regardless, I just wanted to be next to my dad as much as I could, you know. Um, so I'm still, you know, cutting myself, trying to sock glass just to see how much I'll bleed. I have so many, so many scars on my hands and, and my arms. Um, nine years old, my dad was on drugs. He was trying to get money out of my mom and he was trying to take her purse. Um, it was a regular night. Mom getting beat up, mom getting yelled at, mom getting slapped around. We're living on, in Maple, on Maple Street in South San Francisco. And I'm, me and my sister's laying on the couch getting ready for school, putting her to sleep. Um, and the arguing was going, and then there was a, a very silent, still, just calmness. And it didn't sound right. It wasn't the usualness of what, what usually goes on. And it kind of bothered me, and, and my heart started racing. And we're living in a one bedroom, one bedroom apartment with my grandma and it's very small. So I'm able to get up and probably walk maybe 30 steps and I'm into my grandma's room where they were arguing at. And I pushed open the door and my dad had my mom against the wall. She's she black and blue laid out. And then so I, me at nine years old, I'm fresh on the streets, so I feel like I'm Superman. I feel like I'm untouchable, like nobody can stop me. I feel like I'm the biggest, baddest person in the world. Nobody can touch me. How old? Nine. So I push, I push my mom, I push my dad off my mom, and then he, he like backhands me and I fall on the bed and he grabs my mom's purse. My mom already dropped on the floor and then like right when you go out of my, 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 my nana's room, my grandma, rest, rest in paradise, uh, you turn right and the door opens into the hallway and then you turn all the way around and then another door and then there's steps and then you go onto the street. So as he opens the front door to try to go in the hallway, I chase after him, I pick him up and I slam him onto the stairs. We're fighting, 
We're fighting, fighting, fighting. He runs out. I jump on him again outside. We're fighting outside. My mom gains a consciousness. We're going outside. We're fighting each other. And he leaves. So I experienced this my whole entire life to where my dad leaves. Two months later, my mom got a new boyfriend. <laughs> mm. And then it's just like, well, what about me? Now I'm getting older. Well, what about me? I'm getting older. Well, what about me? Sure. So 11 years old, I got into the system, um, running around with kids, you know, just being a little just knucklehead. Um, when we're throwing rocks at a light, you know, just messing around, you know, just um, people throw rocks at things that shine. And we're just throwing rocks being kids and, you know, we get arrested. And I ended up going to juvenile hall, well, getting put on probation, and they went to juvenile hall for a day, and now I'm in the system, 11 years old, for just vandalism. Mm -hmm. uh, the kids I was with kind of turned their back on me and snitched on me and said it was me, it's my fault, I'm the one that started it, I'm the one that led it, whatever. Um, I got to baseball at a very young age, I was very good, but at the same time, my anger still led me to, to bring it to the baseball field. Now I'm fighting on the baseball field, now I'm arguing with people, now I'm just beating to my coaches, but I'm the rawest person out there. I would always go to practice drunk. I always go to like my all-star trials drunk. But a lot of the coaches wouldn't mind it because I was that good. Like no matter what, like they would still allow me to be disrespectful, be a fighting person, be under the influence while I'm going to practice because they knew how, how talented I was. They knew that I was, gonna, I was gonna take them far, which it really was. That's how my life was and then, you know, just being involved in the street life, people were scared of me because of who I was, the identity that I had, and me just not caring about, I don't care about dying. Dying doesn't mean nothing. Like, if anything, I wanna die, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So Satan became a part of my life growing up. I didn't understand who he was or what he was. I didn't understand who Jesus Christ was or what he was. I just knew it, they were both a part of my life. Mm -hmm. Growing up, I was, you know, somewhat a traditional Catholic person, right? Because my family, we only go to church for holidays. But living in South City at, at a certain time, I'll go, to, um, I'll go to Spruce, and All Souls Church was always open 24-7. So every time I walk to school, I'll go inside there and I'll pray. Every time I come after school, I'll go inside there and pray. Don't know what I'm doing or how I'm doing it, why I'm, I don't understand anything, but I'll do it. And it just, for some reason, Jesus Christ always been in my life. I've always talked to Jesus Christ since the time I committed, tried to commit suicide at five years old. I've always talked to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ's identity was in the house because of you know, the Catholic family that I had, uh, watered down Catholics though. But growing up, I, I was always talking to Jesus every single time. So it's just like, I've always felt like Jesus was with me and I was a part of Jesus before I even can even accept who Jesus Christ was. He was already, I was already a part of him. Uh, when I was 11 years old, um, I went to juvenile hall. They was having their services, and I, I accepted Christ as my personal savior. Because of the stuff that I was going through in my life, I knew that I needed somebody else other than what I was doing to myself. Mm -hmm. So I accepted Christ as my savior. I, I knew who he was. I knew that Jesus Christ is my savior. I knew that he died on the cross. I knew he shed blood, and I knew through him that I have eternal life. I knew, I knew everything that was said inside the Bible, and I knew that it was said through these people, was true because of what I've experienced. Mm -hmm. But still, it didn't stop me from experiencing what I had to in the streets. Sure. Um, I've experienced shelter. I mean, like a, it's like a shelter type group home. And I believe I was like 13 or so. Um, I was just a troubled kid, just getting involved with my mom, not listening to her, fighting with her, being disobedient. Um, so my mom told my probation officer, he needs, he needs to go somewhere. I went to a program in uh, Santa Clara called the Bill Wilson Center. Mm -hmm. Very beautiful program. I didn't take it serious. I just wasn't fully understanding who I was. I wasn't, I wasn't at the end of myself yet. 14 years old, came around, um, tried to kill my cousin um, because he tried to rape my girl. I was very intoxicated um, and she was next to me and just her screaming, got up and seen him on top of her, tried to kill him. <clears throat> um, there was, it was a bad, bad scene. Like the police and my probation officer said that it looked like somebody got axed and killed inside the house. That's how much blood was everywhere. I ran down the street and I chased him. I socked four windows out of a car and then there was a trail. That's how they, that's how they found where my house was and, and who it was because the trail of blood from two blocks down all the way up. And it was, it was very, very thick blood all the way up to my house, all over the house. And then um, I ended up doing three years in a group home at an intermission house. It was okay. a rehabilitation. It was either go to YA 
or I met that I have a drug alcohol problem, which I did, mm -hmm. and go to a group home. How old were you at the time? 14 years old. Okay. And so I was in a group home for three years. Man, you've had a full life. All the way up to, I mean, from, from five to not, wow. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. And that's just what I can recall now, but if you have more questions, certain things will probably pop up, but uh, yeah, brother, I, I've, I've been, I've been through, I've been through a lot of mess. It was more of just like self -val validation. Like I needed somebody to tell me that they loved me. Mm -hmm. I needed somebody to tell me that you were okay. I needed somebody to tell you like, hey, man, you just come here. And it was never none of that. Sure. It was always like, here's some money. Here's this. Here's that. Get out of here. Go, go figure it out. So it's like I did all these things just to get attention. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, I fought people and I was good at it. And I wasn't the type of person that was just like, hey, we got funk on the block or we got problems. I was the one to go take on 10 people by myself. Sure. And I, I accomplished the whole entire task by myself. Like I was known as that person. Like you don't mess with this guy. Like mm -hmm. he is, he's that person. Sure. And I don't want to say too much that's going to like uh, incriminate me, right? Because it's just like certain police officers still don't like me to this day. And I don't want to say things that, that's going to, uh, lead to that and that's not the direction I want to go. My direction is to really just help people to understand, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay, so really quick. So um, We're at 15 right now. Yeah, right. So so you go to the group home for three years and you yeah. get out I ran well, you ran I ran because they was it was BS inside there Okay, and it was just it was I, really I, messed I've up. Heard, I've heard a lot of horror stories yeah. of group homes. Yeah, so now what happens? So let's get to 18 so I, what, when did you, because I know you went to prison. Yeah. So, um, okay, so where, okay. So there's just, there's so much. Yeah, I mean, there, I, we there is. We spent an hour and a half yeah, on, this, there, on this. But it's okay, I mean, <laughs> as long as we can help help the people, and yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. that's really what it's for. It's not, it's not to really, like, idolize me or uplift me, but it's just really to show people that um, there is people out there that, that we, we can relate to, and there is people out there that are struggling just like us. And I think that that was one of the things that I, I struggled with is I couldn't relate to nobody. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, didn't, I didn't feel like there was somebody out there that understood me. I didn't, I didn't feel like there was people out there that, that really did love me and really did care for me. It, it, I felt like it was more like, like certain motives that people just did things for me just to shut me up. Mm -hmm. But when I got older, I did realize that there are people that, that, that really do care. Sure. And I couldn't see that because of my hurt was in the way, my pain was in the way, right. I was in my own way. Sure. So when I ran from the group home, I got locked up and then another group home came and evaluated me and accepted me, Walden House. I got to a situation over there and I ran. I did three months over there, I ran and my probation officer said, look, you're gonna go in for a little while, you come home, you're gonna go home finally. You give me your high school diploma, I'll get you on probation. Did it. So I was so behind in school, so behind in school, but I showed my teachers and I was only, I had three months left to, uh, to graduate and the high school I went to, I got kicked out of there and I went to a continuation school at Baden in South San Francisco. And I was always going to the library every single day. I was like, I don't care, by all means, I'm gonna get my high school diploma. Like, I don't care if I have to steal books. So my buddy was staying with me at the time and we would go to the, uh, we'll go to the school while I'm talking to my teacher, he would steal the books for me. And then I'll go back and I was like, I don't care, I'll figure it out, just give me all the homework assignments, I'll figure it out, don't worry. And I'll come back and she was like, how are you completing these assignments? I'm like, I'm going to the library. And she would go to the library, drop off books, and she would see me. There was like a little hidden spot inside a library by, um, by Burry Burry. And it's not there no more, but the, the, the library is there, but not the little cutty spot. So she'll come by, she'll like, you're really serious about this. I, I said, I really am. Like, I'm really ready to fight and do whatever it takes to get my high school diploma. So she would bring me um, uh, work assignments. And she got my credits up, got my points up. So then it came for graduation. I took my test and I was behind. And she was like, I'm gonna do this. And wherever she's at in the world, I appreciate her so much just for loving me that much to just believe in me because I didn't believe in myself. Like I just wanted her to get out the way. And she sat down with me, she went through all the questions um, that I got wrong and I passed and I was able to graduate. Cool. Months later, caught attempted murder, semi-automatic. Mm. <laughs> Did a month inside there, beat it, um, and then when I was, uh, right when I turned 19 years old, um, caught, a, 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 caught a murder case. Okay. And then I uh, was finding a murder case in San Francisco, A50 Bryant, and uh, did about a, almost two years inside there and went to trial. Uh, my first trial was hung jury, 9-3 uh, conviction, 
So then three, three people found me not guilty. So I went to another trial and then all 12 juries found me not guilty. I came home and when I came home 2007, August 7th, a um, couple months later, I got into another altercation um, and now I'm charged with some, they were, I was basically under investigation. And then I went back to church, 18 years old to, back, back, uh, to go backwards. There was a pastor named Dedrick, Dedrick Landers from Westside Baptist Church. And he was always coming to my house and I was always respectful to him and my, my buddies wasn't. He, they were very rude and obnoxious, right? And so I had to close the garage because they was drinking, partying, and smoking and stuff. And I would always give him respect and just listen, he's a man of God. And I um, was always talking about God, rededicated my life again to, uh, with, with the Lord through him. And uh, went up to the church where he was pastoring at Westside Baptist and got baptized for the first time when I was 18 years old. And then my road went downhill. Um, and then 19, uh, got out. I mean, 20, almost 21, I got out uh, fight, uh, fighting the murder case and it caught another case. And then 2008, I was like, I'm done. I can't do this no more. Like, I need to really get myself together. So I went to, to college. I went to DeVry College in Daly City. Uh, it's not there no more. And I wanted to be a juvenile probation officer. That was my goal. Like, I'm putting everything aside. I'm going back to church. I'm going to school. I'm handling my business. But as I started to gain strength in, in my, my spiritual life with, with Jesus, I feel like I can do it by myself. I feel like I don't need, I don't need God as, as much as I, I know I need him. To where it's just like, oh, I could go kick with these friends and I, I'm helping them out. And it's just like, well, Jesus Christ ain't never told me to do that. Right, the Lord ain't never told me to do that. The Lord, He ain't. I told myself I could go do this, and He's sitting back like, I never told you to go talk to these people. I never told you to go right. be down there for that many. Now I'm missing church. Yep. Now I'm missing school. Now I'm falling back. My grandma's sick, and now I'm just like, eff it. What's up? Now I'm back to the game again. So, um, 2009. Now my head is just spinning, going crazy. Two of my grandmas are, are just very sick, mm -hmm. and I just gave up and that's what happens when I let go of God I just I let go of him to the point to where I feel like I could do things the way I thought I could do things and it just wasn't and it showed me a lot that anything without 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 God it's it's impossible right you know like I just started kicking with the people that I was supposed to kick away and now my anger and my sadness and my overwhelmingness and my depression my anxiety and everything that I was going through just kicked back in and now I'm just fumbling with these people that I shouldn't be with. And then um, I was supposed to go to church Wednesday night. I forgot what date it was, but Wednesday night I was supposed to go to church and I didn't because I was with two of my, two, my cousin and my buddy. And um, a situation happened and a guy got beat up very bad inside Winston Manor in South City. And, um, and then I got arrested for that, got bailed out. Another situation happened. Uh, two females got beat up bad and now I'm facing 42 years of life. And now I'm back in. And that's when I was uh, 20, 22 years old. And then I'm facing 42 years of life, fighting that. And I just looked in the mirror and I was just like, like, what are you doing? Like, I'm talking to myself. Like, what are you doing? Like, how many times are you gonna keep going over this until you understand, like, this ain't, this ain't what it is no more. It's, it's not, this is not you no more. And of course, you know, going through my struggles, I was very like angry at myself on what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing is wrong, but I'm still doing it, mm -hmm. right? You look at Paul and he's like, the things I should do, I don't do, and the things that I, you know? Right. So it's just like the sin that I battle with is like this anger. And I was always angry at my dad. I was always angry at my dad. I'm like, why, 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 why? And during my process, I'm gonna say it now before I get too deep into it, it's like, I finally forgave my dad. like. I finally had to let him go because I feel like he was my reason to feel the way I felt. Like, where was you at when I needed you the most? Like, you left me. And it's just like, I realized it in 2015, 16 or so, I wrote him a letter and I was like, I need to ask you for forgiveness. I, I, I ask that you forgive me, like really deeply, for, you, for me using you as my excuse. Like, you ain't the problem, I was a problem. 
Like you got your own problem and he wasn't even there my majority of my whole life. So I really can't use you as my problem. Like I don't know you. I know of you, but I don't know you. Mm -hmm. And you don't have that right to control the rest of my life. Like I'm using you as just my identity. Like my dad wasn't there, so I might as well act up. My mom wasn't there, so I might as well act up. And it's just like, really, I'm I'm a grown man now. And it's just like, I can't. So I did it and I felt good. So it's just like, I don't have no bad blood towards him. I don't, I don't hate him, I don't despise him, I don't wish him you know, harm, I, may, I wish him nothing but, but the best. Sure. And he's a believer inside Christ, so it's just like, it's good. It, it makes it a whole lot better that you go your way and I'll go my way and I'll see you in heaven. So it's like, if I was to see him to today, I'd say what's up to him, but I wouldn't acknowledge him as my dad. I wouldn't call him dad, I'd just call him Sean. Mm-hmm. And so it, it felt real good to just be able to mature and grow up and acknowledge him as just, you're not my enemy no more. Sure. You know, and it's just like, well, who's my enemy? Nobody. Mm-hmm. You know, the scripture says, it says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Then it lists all these things that can be against us, and there's one thing that's not on there, it's ourself. Mm-hmm. You know, I look at myself, it's just like, I'm the missing piece because I could be my worst enemy or I could be my best blessing. So uh, did you say, so your dad saved today? He saved. He saved and baptized. Wow. He's, he's a... <laughs> He's he's one of those Bible thumpers though. He's <laughs> he's a little he's a little different, but he yeah. he's a he's a believer in Jesus Christ. He lives around here. He lives in Antioch. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, well, at least he's finding finding a path, right? Right. So. Yeah. It's ah uh, yeah. It's. I get it. It's crazy. I it's, get it. It's, it's crazy. Well, but. sometimes we go from one extreme to the other. Right. Most definitely. That, that's I've i I'm in recovery, so I, yeah. I trust me, I get it. Right. So how long did you spend in, so how long was this last experience in So I, I spent 10 and a half years. I, I was I was sentenced to 14 years, 4 months, June 22nd, I believe 2010, I believe it was. And um 14 years, 4 months is what I got convicted of. Um they dropped my gang enhancement. So I was charged with a uh, leader of a street mob gang, robbery, conspiracy, criminal threats, GBIs and weapon enhancements. Mm. So they dropped uh, my attempted murder and my gang enhancement in the same day, and um, I went in facing 16 years, and then I've only got convicted of uh, four counts of GBI weapon enhancement and one count of assault and battery with a weapon enhancement. So I went in 14 years, four months. I just kind of surrendered. You know, I, I kind of surrendered because you don't really know what to expect when you go inside prison. You know, you don't know what you're signing up for. So it's just like. I don't know how long I could hold on to God, you know, until I have to just adapt back into the animal culture is uh, survival skills. Sure. So I just kind of just, you know, all right, God, let's go. I'm, I'm gonna put my faith inside you and hopefully this is what it is. But being inside locked up, like I had so many demons, like I still battle with bipolar, uh, you know, like um, suicidal depression. Like there's not a day that goes by where I don't, I don't think about killing myself. It's just, I could be the happiest person in the world, and all of a sudden I'm, I'm thinking about, man, just go kill yourself. Just just go go get the razor and, and do what you gotta do, or go drive into something, or drive off the cliff, or just go do something stupid. And it's just like, <clears throat> these thoughts in my head, you know, they, they drive me, they used to drive me crazy before. It's just like, I didn't understand, and I was just going crazy and crazy, and hearing all these voices, now I'm just like, man, shut up. You know, it's just like, it, as if it's like, one of my, my uh, like a little brother or a little sister just bothered me. It's just like, shut up. You know, it's like, I don't, I don't pay attention to it no more as if like, um, like I, I'm, I'm doing what my voices is tell me. Sure. And it's like I battle and it's just like a lot of people, how, how can you believe in Jesus Christ if you still have that? Why not? Why not? You know, it's just like, well, I could see if it controls me and if it's my identity now, then maybe the question can be, but it's just like, well, why not? It's just like, if, if I'm battling with an illness, it shows that how far Jesus can go with somebody. If God can make a donkey talk, why can't he make an ill person walk? You know, so it's just like, I have this inside my life because it's, it's be able to help other people as well too. And it's just like, I've always questioned God, why me? Why do I have to go through this for? Why, why? Why do I have to feel what I feel inside and, and, and still be successful with you. And it's just like, well, some people just can't live for themselves. Some people can't live the life that, that they need to live for themselves, so you need to live it for them. And it's just like, well, they need to suck it up, and they need to deal with their life as well, too, because I need to deal with it, they need to deal with it. But it's just, it's a graceful moment that God shows me. It's like, how graceful was I to you? How merciful was I to you? How loving was I to you? How forgiving was I to you, right? And then for us to, to speak about somebody else. Some people just can't go through what they need to go through. So they need somebody else to help them. 
it, it's a battle to 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 deal with. I have to to deal with. Sure. But. So if you get if you don't mind, I mean, if it's not too much, yeah. is there any way? Is there? Any, can you share just a small bit of what prison life is? What that experience was like? <laughs> or, or I mean, I don't know. I, I yeah, know. it's a. Uh, it's very sad. Yeah. It's very lonely. It's sad. It's empty. You have nothing but time on your hands. So you start to role play. You have a lot of grown grown people become kids. You have a lot of kids become grown people. It's very it's very backwards inside there. You you have a lot of people trying to live out their childhood um, developments and dreams and goals and ambitions inside prison. There's opportunities, there's sports, there's programs if you take advantage of. So you see a lot of people trying to relive, you know, their youths. Um, a lot of talented people inside there, very, very smart, eloquent, loving people inside there, very, very much. But then you also have your bad people, you know, of course. You go any, anywhere you go in life, you're always going to have your good and your yeah, bad. The, sure. yin, the yin and the yang, right? Yeah, whatever, yeah. whatever people may call it. Um, you have your blessings, you have your curse. Um, but it's... Um, it's very secluded, you know, so you have nothing but time inside there to think and you become very, very creative. Um, either be, be creative to be the smartest person in the world or be the most stupidest person in the world. Yeah. So you just want to stay you know, the rest of your life behind bars. Sure. Um, a lot of violence, um, a lot of killings, um, a lot of rape, a lot of drugs. Um, but then you just see so many people that are talented and get overpowered with the negativity and it's just like it comes to a point it comes to a point with people to where it's just like well i'm never gonna make it out of here right i'm never gonna have an opportunity so i might as well just adapt into just aggression right. and pain right. right and it's just like if i take all these classes where's these classes gonna go i'm gonna i'm gonna I'm take all these classes and i'm gonna do this for me but i'm still sitting i can't express and i can't show my identity to people this new transformation that i have i can't show it to nobody because i'm never going to go home they're never going to let me home and, and, it's, and it's true you know it's like the, a lot of a lot of the, the board the pro boards and, and, and the ceos they, they look upon your past as if that's who you are today and majority of those people i would say a good amount of those people the percentage inside prison inside jail are not who they who they were. It's just a mistake that happened, and then now they're just they're still being uh, judged and they're still being belittled about what happened in the past. And now it's, that's who you are because look at your paperwork. Your paperwork shows this, but that's not who they are. And it's still so. It's just like it, it comes to a time where people will like do good for so many years inside prison. Like man, f this, I'm going back, right? And it's just like oh well, see, I told you. And it's just like well, you rather just see the negative out of me rather than the positive. You rather just see the bad inside me rather than all the good that I've been doing. Like I'm really doing this and you don't even care. So now it reminds these people of where they came from home. It's like being overlooked, not cared for, not loved, not, not being acknowledged. Like, man, I appreciate you. Thank you. I love you. You're a good person or whatever it may be. Just the thumbs up accomplishments. Just like it, it gives a lot of people flashbacks. And it's just like, well, what else can you do? But just keep, keep a dog inside of a cage. What happens? The dog's going to get excited mm -hmm. right? or the dog's going to get mad. And it's going to bite you. Sure. There's a lot of, a lot of bad thing. And I feel like a lot of my PTSD comes from uh, being incarcerated. You know, seeing people get stabbed and yeah, and and how and so now that you're out, so you've been out since when? Since 2019, November November 19, 2019. Okay, so since you've been out, like you you had shared with me that you've been dealing with PTSD. Yeah. You know, I know that you did some you graduate, you know, you did some uh, fire firefighting yeah stuff, and you got out and and you, you unfortunately got injured, yep. and you've been dealing with the PTSD. Um, how has that how has that journey been? Hard, very hard. I, I can't be around. I'm, I, it becomes I become antisocial a lot, mm -hmm. very antisocial. I can't be in large crowds. Um, just a lot of people around me. Certain noises, certain motions, certain smells still remind me of certain things. Sure. Um, it's it's it can be difficult. Is it getting better? Um, somewhat. Somewhat. Um, I try to do my best not to pay attention to it. I try to just kind of just jump in the water, you know, and just sure. deal with it. Whatever happens, happens. Sure. But it, it takes a lot for me to, to plan something um, and to really get emotionally prepared for it. I can't just do it, right? So if I get a, if I get a notification ahead of time, like, hey, we're going to go here, or we're going to go do this, we're going to go do that. 
like I really got to get mentally prepared to go because if I go in there, I kind of, I get very um, claustrophobic. I get antsy. I get angry. Um, I shut down. And when I shut down, I can't speak. I feel like I'm paralyzed. And mm-hmm. so it's, it's a... It's a little difficult. But so it's almost, it's almost kind of like you're still in the institution. Right. In, in a lot of ways. Right. 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 Okay. I, and, I, and I bring this up and, and have you share that because it gives perspective for people who watch this video or, right. or listen to the podcast. Um, areas to pray for, for you and for others yeah. who um, you know, have made choices to go in the direction that they went in, but now, like you, you you're, you know, you're saved and you're you're doing, you know, I know you're married and you have a kid and, yeah. and you're doing all these things to better your life and be a, a what we call a productive member of society. Yes. <laughs> um, but you're still mentally, you know, and anxiety wise, you still have that stuff that carries with you. Right. So it gives the listener a perspective on what to pray for and right. maybe more understanding for what what happens. You know, yeah. it's like. Um, you know, yeah, we make certain choices and we go down certain roads, but we can change. Right. You know, and uh, the good thing is too, you know, for for all tits of purposes, I'm hoping that there's a police officer or a parole officer or a probation officer or corrections officer or somebody like that that actually listens to this and watch it and watches this and actually can see that you know that people can change right you know i know it's hard because we look at a lot of negative especially in their in their field they see a lot of negativity all the time right. um so they get to a point where they feel like ah once this is always right. this and you can't right. change but right but here we are right, right? and um uh, and that's and that's the thing right um you know i know this is going to sound like a stupid question but uh <laughs> what um what part of your of your success today would you give credit to jesus christ for not to change, because anybody can change, right? Mm-hmm. Like you look at, I could change the light bulb, I could change my clothes, and I could put it back on. So a lot of people is like, they want to change. I, I give credit to Jesus for transforming me. Mm-hmm. To which it's like, yeah, I may have certain um, personalities, I may have certain mental illnesses, but I can be able to control my life now. And that's one of the main things is, I can never, I can never face what I went through. I was always scared. I was always running away from my problems. And, and so I, I, when once I faced into Jesus Christ, he's, he walked me through. He's like, go look at what you're running from. Go, go turn on the light and, and see what you're hiding from. And when I did, I'm just like, this is my mess, right? Or, or this, is, this is the mess that I've experienced. So if anybody can ever deal with it, it's me. I, I sleep with it at night. I wake up in the morning to it every day. So it's just like, I'm looking at things and I'm just like, these things are there to build me, right? If I don't go through the storm, I'm never going to get stronger, right? We talked about the ego process and it's very beautiful. We still talk about this today, me and my wife. You know, so it's like, if I never went through nothing, how am I ever going to have a testimony? If I never pass a test, how, do, how can I have a testimony? So Jesus Christ walked and I allowed Jesus Christ to do it, right? I gave Jesus Christ my will to say, I want you to walk, walk me through this. Take me through it. And I was scared to go back down the alleyway. I was scared to go having to face my parents or, or face certain situations and relive certain things or talk to certain people, ask for forgiveness and be a man and make amends. So it's just like, I give credit to Jesus Christ through everything. And a lot of people can look at me like, oh, he's still the same. Okay, cool. That's good. That's beautiful. What is Jesus? How did Jesus Christ look at me? A man's perspective is way different from Jesus Christ's perspective, right? And it's just like, yeah, I still battle with certain things, but does it control me? Have I didn't? No, it's there. It's just like Paul with a thorn in the flesh, right? It was there to humble him down because he was very arrogant and very prideful. And if he got above his knowledge, he wanted to be above everything else. And I feel like that's the same thing with me too. Like I have these defects in my life to humble me. Right to, to, to show me where I come from. If I don't know where I came from, I'm never going to know where I'm going. And it's just like now today I'm able to look back on what I went through like, yeah, it hurts. Yeah, it sucks. Right. But I'm able to to relate to somebody. It's like going to a, a counseling session and you're only talking to a person that has book smart rather than a personal smart. And it's just like I could be able to relate to somebody like and actually like explain what I actually been through. Right, dealing with the abuse and the trauma and neglect and the alcoholism and gang life. I didn't take that life like how my family did, but I took a different type of a quote unquote gang life if somebody wants to call it. But it's just like I went through that. It was a phase. It's not what defines me. A, def- a definition is permanent. And that's not what defines me. Is my past doesn't define me. Jesus Christ is what defines me. And it's what I, if I, what I give energy to, what, what I give power to, what I give focus to. 
And the very good scripture that I've always acknowledged is to light up your body is your eye. And whatever you pay attention to, that's what you become, right? And today mm -hmm. it's just like, today it, it's very powerful because I'm able to voice, and I'm not afraid to voice my pain. I'm not, I'm not afraid to, to, to face my trauma. I'm not afraid to, to, to be expressive. And that's, I feel like a lot of people struggle with is, is they're afraid of their shame. They're afraid of where they came from. They're, they're, they feel disgusted, so they feel somebody else is going to feel disgusted. And it's not. It's very powerful then to say, you know, this is where I came from. What? You came from there? Yes. And look where I am now. Right? I have a beautiful family. I got a wife. I have a son, which was very troubling at first to deal with when I came home is I didn't know how to, to be in a relationship. I didn't know how to love. I didn't know how to take care of my son because my dad wasn't there. The love that I seen was very broken, abusive, conditional, right? So I'm mimicking what I've, what I've seen. And, and now that I have a, a love relationship with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I'm able to see like, that's not how it is supposed to be. So it's like, I have a lot of rearranging to do. So the transformation part, it's big. Like I give, I give credit to Jesus for the transformation and not the change. One thing that you go inside the parole board when you're, you're, you're a lifer inside prison and you're up against this panel of people and they're talking and, and they're telling, telling you, asking you questions and asking what you have done over the time and why you feel you should be released. And once you say that word change, oh, I'm a changed man, denied. Three years, five years, seven years, extension, see us in three, five or seven years. You don't say change. Anybody can change. It's easy to change. Change your clothes and put it right back on. I could change my image and put it right back on. But a transformation starts from the inside. It doesn't start from the outside. And I feel like that inside is like, yeah, I still have certain defects, but I'm on this path, right? And I'm on that transformation path. Like the thing about the transformation path is I'm willing to be exposed, right? It's like that gymnasium, that Greek word is exercise naked. And I'm willing to walk on this path with Jesus Christ and say, you know what? Like I have what I have. But take it. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow after me. That cross is not a. It's not an idol. It's you. It's me. I'm that cross. Pick up your cross and let's go. Come, come up to that Calvary with me and let's go die. And and I feel like that's where I'm at at this point is, is to knowing that what I've been through is is not a sad, sobby story, a love story, or a hate story, whatever whatever story a person wants to identify it as. It's something that I needed to go through to help somebody else. And I'm not that type of person to say, well, if I help one person and I'm, my job's done. No, my job just begun because now I know that I have an opportunity to, to impact somebody. So my job just begun. Let's go, let's go get more people. You know, so it's like, yeah, suicide. Went to the hospitals plenty of times for cutting myself and want to commit suicide. I've been to the hospitals before. I've been trying to do the medication. Don't work. I refuse it. The only medication that I've ever needed that ever helped me was Jesus Christ was the Bible. I just stuck to prayer, I stuck to my scriptures, I stuck to Jesus, and I kept going. And every time I stepped away from Jesus, that's when I started fighting, that's when I started cutting, that's when I started doing drugs, that's when I started wilding out in the streets and doing things that I'm not supposed to do. It's when I stepped away from Christ is when I became that identification of a mental ill person. Mm. It's, I'm here now you know, because of Jesus Christ, and if it, if, if it wasn't for Jesus Christ, I wouldn't be here. Yeah. You know? That's awesome, man. Uh, this is, I, I, okay, so this is, I'm just going to say this right now. This is uh, uh, David's testimony, take one. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're going to come back. Yeah. This is, I want to wait, if, wait maybe six months okay. or so, but I definitely want to come back and do like, like where, where, from where we leave off here yes. to where you are in the next six or eight months. Um, definitely want to have your wife, Vanessa, yes, come in and share definitely. her testimony yes. as well. But this is, <clears throat> Your, your life is, and I really, and I'm so grateful that we've taken this little over a year off and my right. very first video Amen. podcast we're going to put out is, is this one. <laughs> I mean, your, yeah. your, your, sto your story is amazing. I mean, at the, you know, I'm, I'm sorry to, that you had to go through what you went through, but what you went through from a very young age right. to where you are today is just, I'm just sitting here like, and just, I'm blown away. Like the transformation. Mm -hmm. So I, your yeah. stories hit me in a lot of in a lot of areas for myself personally that that I've can I, that I can relate with. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's some areas. Obviously, I've never been in prison. I've done county time, but I've never been yeah. in prison. But just wow, just it's just eye opening yeah. and the transformation in your life. Um, you. Before we uh, close this out, I just want to ask you: Is there 
like any like any um, uh, Bible verse that you want to leave us with? Is there any um, uh, advice that you want to leave people with, or, or or just any kind of like? Is there a, a David quote that you have? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I just is there anything that you want to leave people with that that might be watching this and just like like me, just like wow, this is that's powerful. I think the the main the main just topic of what I'm here for is to help people understand Jesus, okay. right? Like Jesus ain't Jesus ain't real. Jesus can't be real. Look at all the pain. Look at all the suffering. Look at the kids getting killed. Look at the rapes and the A, B, and C. Well, once you identify what sin is, then we're able to understand Jesus Christ. And it's not Jesus Christ. It, the, the Bible says it. The Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy, while God comes to give life. And it's just like we we tend to pay attention to that that big tornado a lot. Rather than not not understanding what's in the middle of that tornado, that and the middle, the center of that tornado tornado is peaceful, it's calm, it's quiet. But once we attend to look at what we look at, we attend to get caught up in that. So my thing is Jesus. Even if you feel Jesus Christ is not real, He still remains real. That's how really it is, right? It, your 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 experience in your life is is limiting yourself to the experience something real. In order to know something, you have to have personal experience. So if there is somebody that's watching, that's kind of on the iffy side of of not wanting to accept Jesus Christ because of certain philosophy or someone's vain to see or walking away from Jesus Christ because they feel like Jesus Christ let them down, I, I feel like you should most definitely automatically stop right now, right? Because I was at a point where I, I, I confessed to Satan myself. I confessed to him as being my Lord and being my Savior and being my God 100%. And I'm sitting here today saying that Jesus is real based off me not letting go of Jesus Christ. And me experiencing, I want to see who Jesus Christ, I was a very curious person. I needed to know. I couldn't go to sleep at night because I've always felt like I was going to miss something. So that's how I felt with Jesus Christ is, I don't want to miss out on nothing, so I want to know the truth. I've experienced who Satan was. I've experienced everything of his tactic is. I've experienced who he is, what he is, how he smells, how he looks like, the different types of forms and, 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 and formations he comes. I understand who Satan is 100%. What I never understood was myself in, in Jesus. I understood my identity in saying I didn't understand my identity inside Jesus Christ and I wanted to find out. Give Jesus Christ an opportunity, right? Give him an opportunity to know who you are. Give him an opportunity for you to know him and who he is. He didn't have to die. He didn't have to carry that cross up. He didn't have to get whipped, whipped how many times he did. He didn't have to come down here for 33 years and just give you what he gave you just to walk away and say all oh, that I was just for show and tell. Give Jesus Christ an opportunity to understand for yourself, not from, you can't live your life and you can't base your faith off somebody else's walk and somebody else's lifestyle. Base your faith off your own faith with Jesus Christ and understand for yourself who Jesus Christ is. Because mm -hmm. Jesus Christ is real. He's 100% real. Mm -hmm. And he 100% died for you. 100% through his, his whips, you are healed through all your pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. If you confess to him, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you all, from all unrighteousness. And I never understood that. To cleanse me from all my unrighteousness, not just these little bit right here, and I don't know about those ones. No, he says, I'm going to cleanse you from all unrighteousness, mm -hmm. right? For whoever is in Jesus Christ, he's a new creature. The old things are passed away. Behold, all things are to become new. You need to experience that for yourself because I'm going to say right now, you're missing out. And the only way to experience that is accepting Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ is the only way. Amen. I thought making my way through my hood and through my people and through my recognition, my credibility in the streets was a way to get. It wasn't a way. It was just bringing right back to that. I've always experienced through Paul is whatever you called out of, you'd be called right back into. And now I'm being called back into the ministry. And I'm being called back into helping people that are just like me or even worse or worse than me. It's just like I've always get anxious. I've always get anxiety. I'm like, ah, oh, they won't understand me. They no, they do. They do. Once you open up your mouth, you'll realize how people, how many people will listen on what you say. You're gonna have people that are gonna listen to the BS, and you're gonna have people that are gonna listen to the righteousness. Jesus Christ is the only way, right? Mm -hmm. he, Jesus Christ says, "I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father but through Him." Amen. Confess your mouth and believe in your heart. That God rose Jesus from the dead, you shall be saved. Saved from what? I'm, what do I got to be saved from? I'm a good person. Okay, well, for by grace you are saved through faith, not of your works, lest any man should boast. So it's not your works that's going to get you to heaven. It's not how many good things. You're not spitting on the floor. You're not littering. You're not breaking the law. You're not jaywalking. You're not disrespecting any. No, it's by your faith. If your faith in your works, you feel like your works is going to get you where? Okay, well, it's easy for a camel to enter the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. 
So I just ask that you just really just find out for yourself who Jesus Christ is. Really give him an opportunity. Well, I did. No, you didn't. Because if you really did, then you wouldn't be walking away from him. Amen. Love you. I love you and I appreciate you guys for allowing me to be a part of this. I know there's a whole lot more that I want to say that I'm just like, what to say? Because there's so much to say. Sure. But um, you ain't broken until you understand what Jesus Christ is. And a lot of people feel like they're lost, but I look at Carlos Santana. He told his, uh, one of his uh, band players, the, um, he's like, he, well, he ain't lost, he's just misplaced. And when I heard Carlos Santana say that, I was just like, it makes you feel a whole lot more hopeful rather than hopeless to say, man, I'm not lost, I'm just misplaced. I need to get back on track. Sure. Allow Jesus Christ to be that source. Allow Jesus Christ to come in your heart just to show you who he is rather than being identified by somebody else on what he may be. Jesus Christ ain't who somebody else said. Find out for yourself and then come back and tell me who Jesus Christ is because I guarantee you're going to have a different perspective. I love you. May the Lord be with you always. Amen. Right on. Thank, Thank you, David. Thank you. That was really good. Wow. Okay.